In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let me respond first to the welcome that the rector has given to Fletcher and to me this afternoon. It's wonderful to be here again, and wonderful to think that we have a whole week together to explore and contemplate the deep mystery which the anthem has just given us in a way so much more powerful than I can possibly attempt in a pulpit, the deep mystery of our Lord's full final sacrifice. This is indeed a time of gifts. The church gives her children throughout this week an opportunity to explore in full depth the meaning of that full final sacrifice. And we may do so in a multitude of different ways. But we do have to set aside time in our own lives to do that. Whether we do that at home in contemplation with words from the services that we may have attended or the reading of the scriptures, particularly those connected with that last week of our Lord's human time on earth before Sunday gives us the bright gleams of heaven's glory to the astonished eyes of the apostles whose motion on that day changes from a slow place to a run of excitement and proclamation. It's wonderful even to contemplate this week again, for each year we come round in this way of thinking about the glorious truths that are set before our own mortality. Jesus himself goes through day by day a sequence of experiences and on the days set out before us, our prayer books have often given us a whole passion. The old Book of Common Prayer gave us on this Sunday the Matthew Passion, and then two days of the Markan Passion, two days of the Lucan Passion, and on Good Friday, the John Passion. And they are different. They're different with the particularity of each evangelist and we get to know them. Their sources were different, and as those sources were collected together, they've given us a marvelous tapestry of different images. But we'll try on this journey, for it is a journey, the next few days up to Easter Day itself, a journey that on most days I'll have chance to comment on as we go along. It gives us chance to see how that journey unfolds. And that's what we'll attempt to do day by day. For this is a week with plentiful happenings on each day. And so many of those emotions that we hear read or have within ourselves as we imagine those violent often spiteful, certainly cruel scenes, which our first hymn set out so well, then crucify is all their breath. And as they thirst for his death, we ourselves are with the apostles wondering and with Mary and the beloved disciple at the cross wondering why all this spite when all he came to do was to give us with his own life the love of God and the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In Mark's gospel, we only visit Jerusalem once and we have to wait for that. But in other gospels, Jesus is often found in the temple there's a moment in the Matthew Passion when, having entered the holy city, and that we demonstrated with activity and palms this morning, a moment when 
children begin to shout with excitement at what is happening. Hosanna, Hosanna, they shout in the sacred courts. And you remember how the authorities, careful of the sacred courts, say, silence these children. And you remember how Jesus says, if I were to silence them, the very stones themselves would cry out. Have you never read, he's talking about Psalm 8, have you never read the text, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise? I wonder whether he was thinking himself of his own excitement in the temple when he was of the age of our choristers here and was taken with a village party up to the temple by his mother and father. And you remember they lost him and traveled thinking he was with their neighbors and friends two days and then finding him not there, went back to the temple. And there they found their 12-year-old son sitting quite confidently in front of the doctors of the law, asking questions and giving answers, and we're told they were astounded already by the nature of the answers that the boy was giving. I wonder whether he remembered his own excitement. I'm sure he did. But between that date and this date, I mean, as Luke gives it, telling us that Jesus is 33 years old when he comes to the cross and was 12 years old before that, we have those hidden years when the synoptic gospels either call him the carpenter or the son of the carpenter. All those things are hidden from us, but what is not hidden from us, what is declared so well in this gift that we are given of Holy Week, with all this glorious music and these lessons and time for thinking in holy places and outside, what we have is a gift which is meant for our benefit. I've often been in cultures uh, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, where if you receive a present, I don't know what it's like in the United States, but quite often in England, if someone comes and gives you a present and you're welcoming them, uh, you take it and say, well, uh, thank you, and put it aside thinking, I'll open that and enjoy it later. In those cultures, that's not allowed. Often they have a song which says, open the gift, open the gift, open the gift, gets louder and louder until you've actually opened the present so that they can share your joy in the receiving of this gift, which maybe they've chosen really carefully. Well, think of Holy Week like that. And all of heaven and some of your friends who already have opened that gift will be saying, open this gift, open this gift, for it will do well for your life. And as we go through the week, that will become more and more apparent. But today, the first day of the week, Sunday, when the Sabbath was over, Jesus came from the domestic comfort of the household at Bethany and entered the holy city on the donkey. I've given a, a general title for these sermons. It's a phrase from the Nicene Creed, which we're used to, in accordance with the scriptures. And that phrase covers the way that the creed lists what happens in Jesus's life. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. Well, you can find plentiful reference in the scriptures to what is going on, and certainly, it's in the prophets that you find so many of the sentences. Behold, your king comes to you, meek, and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the fold of an ass. A triumphant but peaceful procession with palms waving and the children laughing and shouting and cheering as they enter the holy place. 
tomorrow we'll have a chance to ponder on how Jesus felt about the way in which they were using that holy place. But for the moment, I think we can exalt in his own smiling face, I'm sure, as he looked at the children and said to the authorities, I tell you, if you shut them up, the whole place, the stones of the temple will start to cry out. We're told from historic sources that that temple, which was destroyed completely by the Roman armies in AD 70, that temple had, weaving around its beautiful marble, a vine made in pure gold up and down the pillars with its leaves. And perhaps the I am sentence, which most equates to that, is I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Every branch that bears not fruit is pruned. For the vines must produce fruit. And Jesus is finding that in the temple at that time, he was seeking hard and not finding that fruit, as we'll see. But nevertheless, he is using such rich imagery. I've known many changes in lectionaries, but always on this Sunday afternoon for Evensong, it's always been Isaiah 5 and Mark 12. And the first verse of each takes you straight to the same scene, the vineyard planted so carefully with its watchtower, its walls, irrigation ditches, and planted with choice vines. And instead of good fruit, it produced wild grapes. And in Isaiah, you get the story of the Lord saying, I will take down the wall and the vineyard will be destroyed. I looked for good fruit and their meaning, fruit of the right quality of life, the right behavior one towards another. We live in a violent world now, more violent than we've known for many, many years. And it's that kind of violence is described by that very powerful sentence at the end, saying that the, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the people of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting, supposedly. And he looked for righteousness and found only oppression. He looked for justice and found only a cry, a cry of distress. It doesn't take us long in any news bulletin or any video or television uh, pictures of what's going on in parts of the world to have to look far for a cry of that sort. But it's for us to make sure that the fruits of the vineyard, starting with our own fruits, our own society, are producing the right fruits. And Jesus has come to seek that from the temple as he goes to it on this particular day when we remember his entry into Jerusalem. Lo, the full final sacrifice. That is about what he, that just going to be what he's going to do now, to ride to his full final sacrifice. And perhaps of that beautiful anthem written in that mystical period of the early 17th century, which fostered George Herbert and John Donne and Henry Vaughan, Nicholas Ferrer. This is Richard Crawshaw with Finns's beautiful mystical music so beautifully sung this afternoon. O oh, let that love, which thus makes thee mix with our low mortality, lift our lean souls and set us up convictors, joint victors of thine own full cup, co-heirs of saints, that so all may drink the same wine and the same way. That must be our prayer on this Sunday at the beginning of Holy Week, 
take the service order home, muse on the lessons of the vineyards and on that beautiful poem, and unwrap the gift which we have a week to enjoy. Amen.